It's a great honor for me to be here with you. Uh, well, as uh, you may know, um, I was appointed a uh, special rapporteur um, a year ago. So I'm new. Uh, I'm learning how to deal with this great honor. Uh, great honor at the same time, oh, uh, a, a challenge as overwhelming as it is exciting for me. Very, thank you very much. So, and uh, well, uh, during this year, I'm learning and learning, and I think I will continue to learn for the whole time I am in the chart. It is for three years, but then if the rapporteur wants to continue, automatically is three more. So normally it's for six years, okay? Well, I will present to you perhaps uh, my, uh, I have half an hour, no, as a great honor, and uh, I will present the main concerns, the main ideas, uh, and the, 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 you know, the working plan I have for the, th the three, for the first years, no? Uh, and open the, the debate and you choose which questions are most, uh, the most interesting for you, okay? I used to say in my first uh, thematic report, uh, we, we present two reports every year, you know? The one is around mid-September before the, the Human Rights Council in Geneva. The second one is one month later, uh, mid-October normally, uh, before the, the uh, UN uh, General Assembly in New York. So uh, the, the first report I presented last year uh, in Geneva uh, was analyzing what is the, the general context, uh, the, the state of the, of, the, of the affair, of the question of the water and sanitation around the world. And um, as I used to do, I employ some kind of, could be a provocative presentation of the situation. I used to say, and I say here, um, we, 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 we face, uh, among others, a uh, very special global crisis, as grave as it is uh, paradoxical. I talk about the uh, global water crisis on the water planet, the blue planet, uh, with, this, with those two billion people, more than two billion people without a guaranteed access to safe drinking water. You know, uh, people who are uh, uh, the most, at least, uh, um, for the most part, um, and of course, with, with the exception uh, of arid territories uh, that with, uh, with climate change could be in some uh, decades perhaps uninhabitable. And in this case, of course, there is a physical lack of water for living, you know, but uh, when we talk about these two billion people, they are, the vast majority are not properly thirsty people without water in their living environments. They are properly impoverished people living close to a polluted river, a polluted aquifer, a polluted lake. At least it, this is my general, uh, general diagnosis. So I used to say uh, the main roots uh, of this global crisis lie in the confluence of two uh, structural uh, flaws in our way of life, in our uh, socioeconomic systems. The first flaw, I think, is the flaw of inequity and poverty that we have generated and we generate at present from, from my point of view, profoundly unjust unfair and moral uh, socioeconomic systems, is my point of view. And the second flaw is the flaw of unsustainability uh, that we have provoked in our aquatic ecosystems, uh, turning water from being, I used to say, the blue soul of life, you know, from being the key uh, of the life we know in this planet, uh, into the most terrible vector of disease and death ever known by the humanity in the 21st century. On the basis of this uh, diagnosis, uh, from my point of view, there are, I propose, two axes on which uh, to focus our efforts. 
The first one is, I used to say in this expression, to make peace with our rivers, with our lakes, with our aquifers, to make peace with them. Because I am sure, I, I, I insist on this, uh, if we do not uh, are able to restore uh, the health and functionality of these ecosystems, uh, rivers, wetlands, aquifers, lakes, uh, on which uh, these communities, these two billion people need to supply themselves in a daily basis. If we do not are able to, 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 to improve the health of these ecosystems, it is not possible to make real progress in achieving, in, in, uh, uh, the, 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 in, in getting safe drinking water for these people. I think it's some kind of two, uh, uh, two challenges, confluent challenges. The one of recovering the good ecological state of these ecosystems and the one of uh, achieving the, the universal access to safe drinking water for these people and for, for everybody. You know. Well, the second uh, issue, the, the second axe uh, working uh, in our, for our efforts uh, in front of this, of the, facing this, this uh, global crisis, is promoting, from my point of view, democratic governance of water as a common good. I will talk about this, but uh, the challenge we face with this global water crisis, I used to say, is not a business opportunity. I'm sorry. These two billion people are not a good opportunity for making good deals, good profits. They are impoverished people. They cannot afford for nothing. So from my point of view, we are facing with this question a democratic and ethical challenge a democratic and ethical challenge, not a business opportunity. This is my point of view. So we have making peace with the rivers and aquifers and so on, and building a democratic governance of water as a common good. To understand that I am telling you, I, was, uh, I propose to you a, a quick ethical reflection. Very usually when, when I talk about this and I, I ask for reflection on ethical issues, there's always, very, very often, uh, coming, people coming from, you know, law professionals uh, that say, me, that this mean, uh, is not you, uh, Elida. <laughs> but usually they say to me, uh, Pedro, ethical questions are not the, the key questions because it's nice, it's nice, but it's not effective. We must talk about laws, about, you know, uh, not ethical principles. And so in this sense, I say, okay, let's talk on legal framework, but under ethical principles. Okay? Well, last year, if you remember, uh, the year and the World War Today, 22nd March, was devoted on, uh, we, we asked from the UN. Uh, uh, UN Water, we asked everybody to reflect on the value of water. And there was just uh, being, uh, at, that, at that moment I was uh, appointed, and I proposed uh, nearly the first day, talking uh, instead of the value of water, the values of water. Because this is very important. When we talk about value, we are talking about, yes, could be very different functions, but in money, how much is it? You know, what is the cost? The cost. What is the value? And they say, no, take, let's talk on values of water. They say, uh, look, the water has uh, not just a multifunction, uh, multi-values at stake, but if we try to compare the ones and the others, we can find that it's not possible to compare. For instance, I give you an example. How can you compare the value that for you, you have on, with respect regarding the water, the minimum amount of water you need in your family uh, for a dignified life? 
How much water? How much uh, uh, do you think is the, the value of this water? If you compare it with uh, the value of the water we need for filling legitimately, legitimately a, a, a swimming pool. If you reflect on this, you say, mm, I cannot compare it. How do you compare the, the, the value of, of the love you have for your son and the value of this computer? It's not just to say it's more value or less value. I cannot compare. It's another level. Ethically, is another question. So we can talk about priorities, yes. But their value in the, same, in the sense of having a measure for the one and the other is not possible. This is a very special question for, for water. So this is the reason because I used to say we need to reflect on uh, proposing different uh, category, ethical category. And in this sense, I used to propose to have the distinction between the uses and functions uh, for, that I call the water for life, first, top, priority. I will talk then what, what the, does I mean with this. The second level, the water in uses and functions that uh, are declared, are decided as uh, under the public interest of the community or the society. The third level, the water for economic development, yes, legitimate, but in the third level, not the first one, you know. And even finally, I talk about water users that threaten life. I used to say in Spanish, uh, agua delito, water crime or crime water, no? So, shortly, each uh, kind of uh, ethical uh, level. What, what can I mean with water for life? Well, for instance, uh, well, the, the uses and functions uh, of water as uh, a life support system, you know, for humans and for life in general also, you know. Uh, for instance, uh, the minimum amount of water we need uh, to guarantee drinking water and sanitation as human rights. Uh, this is water for life. That doesn't make sense to, take, to, to talk about scarcity for justifying that we have no enough water for human rights. That doesn't make sense because how much water we can decide is the minimum amount for a dignified life and so on. Uh, the, the Supreme Court, I think in Colombia, talked about, I think, 60 liters per day. It doesn't matter. It could be 100, could be 50. In this kind of amount of water, do you know what, how much uh, water it represents in comparison with the water we are extracting, we are uh, deriving from, from the, 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 the rivers and aquifers? No more than four, three, four, five percent. No river will dry because of extracting 5% of the water we are extracting at present. So, if we make priority on the human right to water and sanitation, there is no possible scarcity. Well, I, exception, arid, semi-arid, extreme arid, uh, under climate change, okay. This is a very specific space, no? Another, uh, the water needed uh, to produce the food uh, that communities in vulnerable situations need for the, the, the food they need for the life. For the life. So it's the human right to food. It's not a big amount of water, it's a short amount. And even, this could be more water. Uh, the, the, the water, the flows and the water quality, quality necessary to guarantee the sustainability, the health of rivers, of lakes, the environmental, needs. This could be more, but it is also linked to human rights at present, because now we have recognized this year, less than one year ago, the human right to healthy environment. So healthy rivers and that is something already recognized. So this kind of uses and functions for me is water for life. And this is the top priority because it's the base of life. The second level is the uses of public interest. I gave in the, some examples, but yes, if a society, a community uh, 
decide uh, that this building is, is an heritage to protect in the name, on behalf of, of uh, the, 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 uh, the public interest of the building. Well, it is a priority. In water issues, we have a lot of uh, users that are declared as uh, democratically, as, uh, as a, a public interest of the society. The third one, the economic development, of course, in productive activities. In this case, yes, it is the, 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 the 80, 90 percent of the water demands are for activities, economic activities, mainly agricultural activities, irrigation, but also industry and so on. It's legitimate, but it's not the first priority. It is not fair to say, well, I put in uh, Paraguay, uh, uh, I want to make, to, 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 to make paper, no? Uh, and, uh, well, I pollute the river because, but uh, I am, I'm building an economy and uh, uh, jobs for people and so on. No, but there is no justification for poisoning the people living downstream. There is no uh, le legitimacy for this. So in this sense, uh, is a third level, uh, the economic development. Uh, uh, and in this case, yes, we can build scarcity. We can build scarcity. We have built scarcity for many things. Now at present, uh, we can say that the atmosphere is scarce. Climate change. If the atmosphere were bigger, with more capacity of uh, digesting or uh, uh, avoiding the climate change, what is scarce for us? Or the, or the, the planet is scarce. We need five times the, 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 the planet. And the rivers are scarce. So God was wrong? I don't know. Uh, if you think from a religious point of view, uh, they, he has built a planet that is scarce for humanity. Or perhaps we have a problem instead of scarcity. We have kind of uh, accident uh, of ambition, uh, lack of prudence, lack of uh, being reasonable and uh, recognizing the limits for living in this planet. I think uh, more than talking about scarcity, we have to recognize the limits of the planet and the limits for sustainability. And talking about water crime or the water uses that threaten life, for instance, uh, open pit mining, uh, toxic, that uh, uh, put in danger the, the health and the life, not just for the present, uh, the, the present uh, uh, generation, but the, the the next and the next and the next generation for uh, this is not legitimate this is a use of water that is not legitimate it must be illegal and be avoided at all costs this is my point of view so if we are able to organize this kind of priorities of course we can we will manage we will need to manage scarcity problems but more in the sense of limiting our, uh, our ambition, sometimes productive ambition, generally of the richest one. No? But is not uh, legitimate, is not right, is not fair to talk about scarcity for justifying uh, the non-compliance with uh, uh, human rights, for instance. That doesn't make sense properly. Under this approach, ethical approach, in, in summary, we need to build uh, a sustainable and democratic water governance from a human rights based approach. But for this, if we continue to reflect, market logic is not the right tool. I am not against market reasonability. It's good for, depending for what. It's like if I say, what about hammer? Yeah, hammer, no martillo. Huh? Uh, you are pro-hammer or anti-hammer? 
You say, well, depending for what doing with this. It is for nailing, for, for, for uh, you know, it's okay. But is it for putting in your head is a bad question. No, no, it's not, the, oh, for walking is bad. So I think a market is not the right tool for dealing with this kind of uh, these ethical principles. And in this sense, I used to say in Spain we have a, 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 an expression, a lemma, that uh, says no hay que pedirle peras a un olmo. In English is something that don't ask peers uh, from an elm tree. You must ask for peers to a peer tree. No? This is the question. We cannot ask market for dealing with human rights, but not because market is perverse and bad. No, it's for another thing. It's not the right instrument for dealing with this, for dealing with a democratic water governance. Well, uh, from, from the neoliberal vision, that is true. From the neoliberal vision, it is considered that water is an economic uh, resource, is a scarce and useful resource. So it's an economic resource um, to be managed as a commodity. This is the, 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 the general approach. No? But um, this approach has, uh, of course, opened up uh, business opportunities in the privatization of services the most the, the well-known. Also in many countries, and I talk on this in my first rheumatic report to the UN General Assembly, um, to sell and purchase not properly water, but the right to use water, the concessional rights. You know? In Spain, it's possible to, as, as it was at property. In the States, it's possible to do it. In Australia, in, in Chile was the first country to do it, with Pinochet at the beginning. So this kind of commodification of water is another trend, another, another option. And finally, uh, is something very, very concerning from my point of view, not just as a mere commodity, but in the, in the last time, finally, uh, water has been uh, considered and is being considered uh, as an asset, financial asset, in the uh, water futures in Wall Street, you know, under speculative logic. Perhaps in the dialogue we can talk about this because it's one of the, of the questions I've proposed as an international debate on this, even if we have not, for the moment, this question here. But is this ha is happening in the States? It will come in one way or another. So it's good to be aware, it's good to reflect on this, it is the right way, under the perspective of dealing better with water scarcity with climate change. There's speculation on the future in order to prevent the future, you know, with climate change. We will talk a little bit on this question. So privatization, commodification, and financialization are in fact three different but closely linked uh, concepts um, around the view of water as a simple economic good. That is the basic issue. No? This approach to water has uh, always, uh, for me, has been very concerning in general. But when, as I said before, I was appointed uh, as a rapporteur, I had just been uh, I have received the news uh, that California water uh, is traded in, in the Wall Street future markets. Um, I therefore decided to, 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 to propose to the General Assembly in the, uh, the UN in, in New York to propose a debate on the financialization of water and commodification. Uh, in recent decades, I don't know if you are, because it's not just for water, it's very grave, and uh, I am proposing to other 
a mandate to make uh, some kind of work together, working together. The Vatican told me we are also interested perhaps in deepening in this debate the financialization and human rights, the speculative strategies and human rights, not just for water, but also for food and others. No? Um, and so it suggests this possibility because I want to continue to work on this and to understand better. For me also, I try to understand better and to propose something interesting around. No? In the recent decades, the financialization of the economy in general has transformed, if you reflect a little, banks from being institutions that provide uh, savings and lending services uh, for productive activities, uh, they are transformed into uh, institutions that govern the entire economy under the dominance of speculative strategies that try to maximize short-term benefits, profits, even if uh, this, in fact, entails serious damage, uh, not only on the poorest, but also to the productive economy. When you have a bubble, uh, the financial bubble with, uh, with housing, for instance, is not good for the economy. It's a disaster for the poor people. It's a disaster. But for the whole economy, it's also uh, is not positive because of this kind of strategies they're not in, in, in good coherence even with the uh, traditional uh, logic of the market and there are more and more economists saying what are we doing with this with this uh, deregulation of the financial markets at the end of the 20th century well the entry of water into Wall Street future markets means managing its value, as I said, as a financial asset under the speculative logic that dominates uh, these markets. And I try to explain, you have the report, so I invite you to read even perhaps the, 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 the most uh, the, the friendly version is easiest to, 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 to read. Future markets have traditionally existed, uh, has been spaces where producers and large traders negotiate prices uh, through commodity futures uh, contracts that allows, um, allow them um, to reduce the risks uh, associated with future uncertainties uh, performing functions uh, of price discovery is the technical uh, term and price stabilization. Uh, well, could be interesting in general. But since 1990s, uh, financial deregulation allowed banks and other powerful financial players to speculate with commodity, basic commodity, food, uh, under poor, very poor regulatory uh, control. Uh. In that context, commodities uh, and particularly food products entered in the uh, portfolios of major uh, investors uh, who increased very quickly, uh, increased um, their investment in food and commodity futures. Look, the, the figures from 13 billion in 2003 to 317 billions, so multiply by 30 billions, billion in 2008. The same year that the housing bubble burst and these big banks raised a, a massive amount of public money uh, funds to avoid bankruptcy. The result of this speculative strategy in some months more than uh, 350 uh, billion, uh, I think uh, the billions in Spanish is difficult because a billion in Spanish is a million of millions, and in English, a thousand of millions. Well, uh, well, this huge amount of money devoted to rice wheat in three months, four months, so the results were was a speculative uh, strategy in this kind of markets, and the, the result of this strategy, far from stabilizing prices, 
as promised, uh, there was increased volatility and a new price bubble, uh, this time in basic food stuff. The price of corn tripled, tripled in some months. Wheat rose 127%, uh, more expensive. Rice 170% more expensive in two, three months. Uh, and as a strange consequence, another nearly two, uh, 100 million people joined the rank of hunger and extreme poverty, according to the World Bank. This was the consequence. So this is the kind of strategy in which they are proposing to deal with the value of water. Thinking on climate change, very dangerous. We must take into account that uh, large banks and institutional investors were and are uh, Neither producers for food, for instance, nor traders, nor consumers, they simply speculate. As has seen uh, proved along this, the last two decades, poorly regulated future markets work under the strength of the speculative expectation created by these powerful players and not on the real present or expected supply and demand signals of the products, of the water, of the food. This is the key issue. It's so, so, is, is an economy under the base a casino, but it's not, you know, in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the corner uh, for the people who want to, to, to take uh, uh, risks. No, no, it's for the whole economy, it's for your money. If for all of us, so, so, so dangerous. And for the most uh, impoverished, of course. So, um, this is why at the end of my report to the UN General Assembly, I propose uh, rather than allowing the trading of water in future markets, we should manage, I read directly, water as a public good, ensure sustainable management and develop participatory climate change adaptation plans as recommended by all experts and the UN in order to guarantee the human rights to say drinking water and sanitation, among other questions. No one among the experts, among the international institutions, are proposing for the water in, in, in the future, the risk of scarcity with climate change. Let's go on uh, the speculative strategies on the market. No one is telling this. We are talking about public participation in planning uh, with public participation on the human rights-based approach. And, well, I have no time to continue this way. Let us now turn our attention to climate change, if you want. Today, finally, uh, we have got a general consensus, I used to say, that the use of fossil fuels uh, as the main source of greenhouse uh, gas emissions is the main driver of climate change and, and therefore no one disputes, no one discusses that uh, the, general, the energy transition uh, should preside over mitigation strategies. So, I, I insist on this and in Glasgow I was insisting on this. However, I said and I continue to say, little attention is paid uh, to the fact that the main social impacts of climate change are generated around the water vector. And this is why I insist uh, that requires that adaptation strategies uh, be dominated by the hydrological transition. And I write on this, what does it mean, hydrological transition? I have no time for being more precise. Hydrological transition, in any case, that must be based on strengthening two fronts. Strengthening environmental resilience, and strengthening, on the other hand, social resilience you know, uh, to the risks uh, generated by climate change. Well, strengthening uh, environmental resilience involves involve restoring and maintaining the good uh, ecological status of aquatic ecosystems, especially the most inertial pieces of uh, the water cycle, that is, wetlands and aquifers as well as the vegetal coverage of territories, you know, which will increase ecosystem capacities for storing water and softening uh, fluids. 
especially uh, with regard to aquifers, as the water lungs, I used to uh, use this expression, the water lungs uh, of nature, it is necessary to put an urgent and radical end to the process of over-exploitation and pollution uh, in many uh, sensitive areas of these aquifers so that they can also be used as strategic reserves for future extraordinary droughts. And I insist on this. And this 22nd March, we are insisting on this. The aquifers are key elements for De dealing with, with the risks of droughts in the future, you know. On this basis, it will be essential to promote, uh, in any case, a participative water, land and urban planning on the human rights-based approach and not market approach. This is my point of view. The pandemic, and this is the last reflection, the pandemic, like uh, climate change, confront us uh, with global crises uh, and challenges that not only affect and will affect everyone particularly, but will not be solved without a global strategy. This is very important. However, the pandemic has shown us uh, all this in a painful and shocking uh, way in a very short time. The pandemic has made us individually and collectively feel our vulnerability and has shown us that no one will be safe until we all are covered. And certain, uh, certainly, uh, that uh, which is felt is better and more uh, quickly understood than simply understanding in, in our head, you know. So this is time that uh, was not even the possibility of uh, shielding borders, for instance, uh, or social conditions, uh, the virus traveled, I used to say in this way, uh, th this time the virus traveled by plane, even, even in business class, I used to say. No? Unfortunately, we are um, still beginning to see that uh, making vaccines uh, a multi-billion dollar business and hoarding the vaccines available uh, in the richest country multiplies the appearance uh, of new mutations of virus uh, and definitely uh, plunging the risk for everyone. So finally, even if it is not clear, but we are more and more conscious uh, about this lemma that it is necessary leaving no one, leaving no one behind the, the, the approach we have to adopt. And for the first time we are understanding here, but also here, because we are filling the risk, we are filling the vulnerability. As a result of this lesson, from my point of view, uh, there is now a general growing consensus, uh, regardless of ideologies sometimes and nationalities, uh, on the need to strengthen our public health systems with the uh, corresponding public financial effort as a collective challenge that is not for profit and uh, that should leave uh, basically no one behind. And this, I think, is for the first time we, we begin to have this kind of consensus. At the same time, on the other hand, it has become dra dramatically evident that access to drinking water, sanitation, and the necessary hygiene, uh, including menstrual hygiene for women and girls, is the cornerstone of public health. So, uh, mm, I would therefore be necessary uh, to develop, it would be necessary to develop watch services as part of the challenge of strengthening public health system as a global democratic challenge. This is the key issue. Uh, on the other hand, today the strategy adopted to face the pandemic and the post-pandemic, including the challenge of reactivating the economy and rebuilding the social cohesion uh, of uh, our societies, with the so-called Green New Deal, the last time, you know, uh, of the 21st century, is based on quite important public funds. Uh, unlike it is not the same situation that we had uh, in the 2008 when the, uh, we had the austerity strategies, no, imposed. But in fact, all the money, public money that we had, was devoted to safe, 
know, from the bankruptcies, uh, the, the bankruptcy, the, 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 the banks, no? But at present, we are in a different context. And in fact, uh, I think uh, we have public funds. But the, the question is, uh, what priority we give uh, to those public funds with respect to this democratic uh, challenge that is uh, to reinforce, to strengthen the public health system and particularly water and sanitation services. But is a democratic responsibility to, 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 to decide what to do with this? It is relevant or not? Or perhaps the new uh, priority uh, there that is it in this way is to build and to build more weapons perhaps now with the war. But I continue to insist on this. There is no justification, it is not uh, fair to talk about the financial gap for achieving the uh, SDG 6. To say the financial gap, we have no public funds. We have public funds. But we must discuss what kind of priority we have and if among other priorities we can devote a significant part of these public funds in reinforcing, enhancing, uh, strengthening the public health systems and in particular water and sanitation systems. And finally, also the conclusion, uh, Switzerland, Europe uh, should take a, perhaps uh, uh, propose a leadership, global leadership on this front by taking up the challenge of investment in war services worldwide, no? because we can do it. Accelerating progress towards the SDGs in the face of public health risks and uh, the ones arising from climate change as a democratic imperative, not as a window of business opportunity. This is my final conclusion. Thank you very much.